Hello, welcome to BEH 217 Behavioral Approaches. Today we're going to be covering the Family System Perspective. Perhaps the most difficult adjustment for counselors and therapists from Western cultures is the adoption of a systems perspective. Our personal experience and Western culture often tell us that we are autonomous individuals capable of free and independent choice. Yet we are born into families and most of us live our entire lives attached to one form of family or another. Within these families we create, maintain, and live by often unspoken rules and routines that we hope will keep the family and each of its members functional. In the 1970s and 80s as Generation X came of age we saw a um, very interesting dynamic that we had not seen before which is a separation of family uh, with the rise of divorce rates and the mother working outside the home and the organic family started to separate and what you saw were young people creating their own families um, between friends and that's where that term family came from so even if you don't have a large cohesive organic or biological family your family of choice can also qualify as part of this system a family systems perspective holds that individuals are best understood through assessing the interactions between and among family members Symptoms are often viewed as an expression of a set of habits and patterns within a family. This perspective is grounded on the assumption that a client's problematic behavior may, number one, serve a function or purpose for the family, number two, be unintentionally maintained by family processes, number three, be a function of the family's inability to operate productively, especially during developmental transitions or number four be a symptom of dysfunctional pat patterns handed down across generations all of these assumptions challenge the more traditional intrapsychic frameworks for conceptualizing human problems and their formation one of the big um, mental health issues that we look at family systems perspective in particular with is uh, eating disorders specifically anorexia nervosa where we see um, the young person who is dealing with this mental health challenge really um, suffering from some sort of family dysfunction and that's why family counseling is so important when you are dealing with an eating disorder like that the central principle considered the family or set of relationships as a whole therefore treatment approach that comprehensively addresses the family as well as the identified client is required actions by any individual family member will influence all family members and the reactions will have a reciprocal effect on the individual when change occurs a ripple effect flows throughout the family systems they add that a systems orient orientation does not preclude dealing with the dynamics within the individual, but that this approach broadens the traditional emphasis on individual internal dynamics. So again, if you think about addiction issues, if uh, in a family, mom and dad both have cocktails before dinner and after dinner, and either the son or daughter grow up in this household, and they see that alcohol is something that is used on a regular basis and they begin using it at a young age and when that child develops an addiction issue and it becomes necessary for the family to commit to a sober lifestyle it becomes this dynamic where everyone in the family has to commit to this process and a lot of times the family is very much uncomfortable with this process. Alfred Adler and Rudolf Dreiker and their associates were the first known practitioners of family therapy, often using a model now called open forum family counseling. 
Adler introduced phenomenology to our understanding of the family system or family constellation. Assessment is based on the subjective description that family members use to define themselves and the interactions that occur in everyday life. It is within these interactions that Adlerians seek to discover the purposes and goals of behaviors. And again, what we're looking for is these patterns. You know, these assessments give us trends and we can begin to develop a narrative or an understanding. Murray Bowen believed families could best be understood when analyzed from a three generation perspective because patterns of interpersonal relationships connect family members across generations. Two of his objectives in therapy were to help family members develop a rational, non-reactive approach to living, which is called a differentiation of self, and to detangle family interactions that involve two people pulling a third person into the couple's problems and arguments, or triangulation. An example of triangulation is a couple directs the focus of their energy towards a problematic son as a way to avoid facing or dealing with their own problems. He believed that problems exhibited in one's current family will not significantly change until relationship patterns in one's family of origin are and directly challenged. The cause of an individual's problems can be understood only by viewing the role of the family as an emotional unit. Unresolved emotional reactivity to one's family must be addressed if one hopes to achieve a mature and unique personality. <clears throat> His family systems theory, which is a theoretical and clinical model that evolved from psychoanalytic principles and practices, is sometimes referred to as multi-generational family therapy. The goal of this approach is to differentiate self within a system and to understand one family, one's family origin. Moving on to Virginia Satir, she developed conjoint family therapy, a human validation process model that emphasizes communication and emotional experiencing. She worked to bring family patterns to life in the present through sculpting and family reconstructions. Claiming that techniques were secondary to relationships, she concentrated on the personal relationship between therapist and family to achieve change. The core of Satir's model rely on the power of congruence to help family members communicate with emotional honesty. Moving on to Salvador Minichun's stru structural strategic family therapies, central idea was that an individual's symptoms are best understood from the vantage point of interactional patterns, sequences within a family. He further stated that structural changes must occur in a family before an individual's symptoms can be reduced or eliminated. The goals of structural family therapy include, number one, reducing symptoms of dysfunction, and number two, bringing about structural change within the system by modifying families' transactional rules and establishing more appropriate boundaries. Examples of the goals of therapy. Rashid and his wife are experiencing tension in their relationship because he believes she is far too lenient with their children when they misbehave. This forces him to play the role of bad cop as a parent, which makes him angry. By the late 1970s, structural strategic approaches were the most used models in family systems therapy. So that structure in the household of who's the boss, who's the bad guy, that kind of dynamic becomes very challenging. In the last decade, feminism, multiculturalism, and postmodern social constructionism have all entered the family therapy field. These models are more collaborative, treating clients 
individuals, couples, or families as experts in their own lives. Postmodern approaches to family therapy to reduce or eliminate the power and impact of the family therapist. Taken together, postmodern approaches represent a real paradigm shift in the field of family therapy. Families are multi-layered systems that both affect and are affected by the larger systems in which they are embedded. Both the members of the system can be assessed based on power, alignment, organization, structure, development, culture, and gender. The power of these macro systems to influence family life, especially in the areas of gender and culture, is significant. Given our presuppositions about families and the larger systems in which families are embedded, a multi-layered approach to family therapy is essential. The multiple layers we have noted provide numerous entry points for conducting family assessments, but beginning counselors and therapists will often find that more formal assessment procedures, such as genograms, enable the family structure and stories to be presented in a clearer, more orderly manner. And this is what a genogram looks like. It is a tool for collecting and organizing key relationship in a three-generational extended family. So it's almost like a family tree in a sense, where you start off with grandpa, grandma on both sides, mom and dad over here, you are right here, your spouse, if you have children, your brother, your sister-in-law, and so on and so forth. In the assessment process, it is helpful to inquire about family perspectives on issues inherent in each of these layers. Some questions that might be included in the assessment include, what does each family member bring to the session? Who makes decisions? How are conflicts resolved or problems handled? Are the parents effective leaders of the family? And is the process of leadership balanced or imbalanced? Facilitating change is what happens when family therapy is viewed as a joint or collaborative process. Techniques are more important to models that see the therapist as expert and in charge of making change happen. Collaborative approaches require planning. Planning can still include techniques or interventions, but with the family's participation. Knowing the goals and purposes for our behaviors, feelings, and interaction tends to give us choices about their use. And understanding the patterns we enact in face-to-face -face relationships, the ebbs and flows of life, or across generations, provide multiple avenues for challenging patterns and the enactment of new possibilities. <clears throat> One of the strengths of the systematic perspective in working from a multicultural framework is that many ethnic and cultural groups place great value on extended family. If therapists are working with an individual from a cultural background that gives special value to including grandparents, aunts, and uncles in the treatment, it is easy to see that family approaches have a distinct advantage over individual family or individual therapy. And these cultural backgrounds include cultures such as um, Asian cultures and Hispanic cultures especially. Family therapists can do some excellent networking with members of extended families. Within the field of family therapy, Monica McColdrick has been the most influential leader in the development of both gender and cultural perspectives and frameworks in family practice. Like larger cultural systems, families have a unique language that governs behavior, communication, and even how to feel about and experience life. Because family life is where the roles of women can be most limited, a consideration of gender issues in families is an essential framework for family therapy. Differentiation means coming to understand our family well enough to be part of it, to belong, and also to separate and be our own person. Understanding cultures allows therapists and families to appreciate diversity and to contextualize family experiences in relation to the larger cultures. 
Today, family therapists explore the individual culture of the family, the larger cultures to which the family members belong, and the host culture that dominates the family life. So for example, if you have um, an Asian family who's come over from South Korea or China and they're having a hard time acclimating, you have to keep in mind that Western culture is very different the, than the Eastern culture. Plus you have the problem of acclimating to an, a completely different environment and whatever personal issues are going on within the actual family itself. So there's many layers of issues to deal with within the context of that family therapy. Perhaps the major concern for non-Western cultures would be with regard for the balance that this model advocates for the individual versus the collective. The process of differentiation occurs in most cultures, but it takes on a different shape due to cultural norms. Therapists, regardless of their model of therapy, must find ways to enter the family's world and honor the traditions that support the family. A possible shortcoming of the practice of family therapy involves practitioners who assume Western models of family are universal. Some family therapists focus primarily on the nuclear family, which is based on Western notions, and this could clearly be a shortcoming in working with clients and extended families. So really what you need to do is if you know you're going to be working with a family that is from a culture that you are not that familiar with, for example, a family from Thailand or a family from Nigeria, this is your responsibility to learn about their culture, to learn about the cultural expectations of what the family dynamic is. An integrative approach to the practice of family therapy includes guiding principles that help the therapist organize goals, interactions, observations, and ways to promote change, keeping in mind that it is up to the therapist to do their homework first. So that's it for today's presentation. If you have any questions, please text or email me if you're not class please leave a comment and we will get back to you as quickly as possible so have a great day and uh, we will see you next time